Hello there. I'm Tom Huntington. I am the editor of World War II magazine, and I am very pleased today to be here with author David Sears. Uh, not only does he have a new book out, David is a contributor to World War II magazine and has done fine articles for, for us and for other magazines in the History Net. So, David, thank you for taking the time uh, to talk about the book. Uh, I'm going to show it off here. It's called Duel Perfect. of the Deep. Great. It's published by Naval Institute Press. It deals with the Battle of the Atlantic and a uh, an epic encounter between an American destroyer and a German U-boat. So, David, um, what was it that sparked your interest in uh, this particular topic? Well, I've been familiar with the topic for a fairly long time. In fact, I think, I believe I wrote an article for Military History Quarterly, which gave mm. a short version of the story. Um, and I, this is my fifth book, fifth military history book, and I've been writing primarily about conflicts in Asia and in the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. so I happen to live on the East Coast. Um, I also happen to be a Navy veteran who served on a destroyer on the East Coast. So I thought it probably was time and appropriate to do something about the Battle of the Atlantic uh, especially because uh, the American or the U.S. Navy's involvement in the Battle of the Atlantic, um, there's not much, there's not, not as much written about that as is written about the British experience and obviously the German U-boat experience. Right, right. But was, this would be a good time to cover that and to give both of, I used the framework of the Battle of the Atlantic itself but the through story was this uh, uh, incident, this battle between uh, German U-boat U-405 and the USS Bory, uh, which was a, a World War I era uh, destroyer, US Navy destroyer. Mm -hmm. And the, the final uh, you know, element in this, the deci deciding element is this, is a lot of the sailors aboard the Bory uh, were youngsters, teenagers from uh, New Jersey, and I happen to live in New Jersey, so that kind of added a home element as well. Yeah, a little, little bit of a personal connection. Sure. Uh, what, yeah, one thing you mentioned was you you wanted to capture the words, thoughts, and emotions of uh, of, of this encounter, and you know which you did. Um, and you have a lot of uh, really personal information from uh, members of the crew of the of the of the destroyer. Yeah, you know, in previous books, I have uh, typically interviewed a lot of veterans, a lot of World War II veterans. Uh, this um, is, by and large, no longer possible to do right. to the extent I used to do it. So uh, I was able to contact uh, some family members, family members living in New Jersey, and I got a trove of, uh, actually in New Jersey and elsewhere in the United States, and I got a trove of uh, letters. Hmm and personal accounts and um, diaries. And interestingly, uh, old newspaper clippings, uh, huh. which, you know, they're, they're interesting because uh, in this case, they were reported right after the battle. And you get those kind of visceral responses from people about how did it feel? What did you do? Uh, how do you feel now that you're back? So those were, those were useful as well. No, oh, I can understand. I mean, it's it's interesting how memories shift over the sure. years too, and so when you get the immediate recollections, it's it is, yeah. you know, much more likely to be what happened as opposed to what they begin to believe happened years later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I'm going to hold up the book cover again so you can see. Sure. You can. And actually, you, while while you're looking at the book cover, if you're questioning, well, what is is this battle about? It's pictured right there, a, a U.S. Navy destroyer riding atop the hull of a a German U-boat and the crew fighting not quite hand to hand, but certainly in close quarters. Yeah, and in building up to that, you you sketch out the the, the Battle of the Atlantic, which is really quite a fascinating um, battle of the brains. I think uh, was a an, an article about that we did. Um, right. You know, there's a lot of code breaking going on, a lot of trying to to figure out where these U-boats are going to be appearing. Right. Um, right. And in and, and in that respect, it, it really differs from any of the land wars, uh, because you're fighting, and for the most part, an unseen foe. Right. Um, um, 
So what I enjoyed about the book is you kind of get the sense that, you know, inexorably this U-boat and this American destroyer are being pulled together by right. by yeah. the 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 uh, the struggle to on both sides to win win the battle of the Atlantic. It was, you know, it was really a, a, a back and forth. I mean, part of the war, a subset of the war was what I would call, well, what, what Churchill called, Winston Churchill called the uh, Wizard War. Right. Uh, it was developments like um, uh, radar and sonar and uh, operational research and code breaking. Um, all those elements um, pointed the adversaries towards each other in this battle in 1943. In one way, is the kind of the culmination of that, although it involves an old time destroyer and one U boat all the elements uh, came into play to make that confrontation uh, happen. Mm -hmm. And um, you had different strategies like on, on convoys, you know, how to escort the convoys and, right. uh, uh, you know, and, and for a time, the Allies were not doing very well in the Battle of the Atlantic. It, it... No, it was back and forth. Um, and, you know, it would one side would uh, advance a new tactic or a new technology and would prevail for a while, and then the other side. And, and during the earliest stages of the war, it was the, the British that were taking the pounding mm -hmm. and also coming up with the breakthroughs that made it possible for the Americans to have their presence uh, in the battle. So it, it, you know, it's back and forth. Um, small things, big things, a range of things that made the battle possible. But when it comes down to it, um, it's, you know, it's sailors versus German U-boat crews yeah. that made the difference. Um, now, a lot of stories, a lot of credible books uh, kind of posit the end of the Battle of the Atlantic, or at least the, the turning point in the Battle of Atlantic, as occurring in April and May 1943, what was called Black May, mm. uh, when the British happened to, uh, you know, their tactics were very refined and they ended up sinking a lot of U-boats and actually forced um, Dönitz, the commander of the U-boats, the overall commander of the U-boats, to uh, concede later on that, you know, this is the point where he knew he couldn't win the battle. Mm -hmm. My focus is that the battle didn't stop there. It, it continued on and, in fact, continued to the very end days of the war in May 1945. And it was during this period from mid-1943 to 1945 that the U.S. Navy came into its own. And mm -hmm. one of the big factors was something called the, uh, the Tenth Fleet, which was a paper fleet. Uh, there were actually no ships assigned to that, but Admiral King, who was in charge of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Navy, arranged it so that forces could be drawn from any fleet element when there was a chance to sink a U-boat. And that flexibility and tactics is one of the things that made a difference for the, the U.S. Navy and helped it su succeed in the, the Battle of the Atlantic. Hmm. Well, tell us a little bit about the, you know, how this encounter between the Bori and the U-405 took place, and uh, just a little bit. It's it was a, you know, a, a very intense uh, personal struggle. In fact, sure. Um, you mentioned that there was a, a an article about it in 1944 in a magazine called Men True Adventure, yeah. which I, I think gives a hint of of you know the appeal. It's like an adventure story in yeah. in, in some sure. ways. Well, it was also a big feature in the uh, in the I forget which edition, probably uh, December of 1943 in uh, in Life magazine. It was a big picture spread about the battle. Lots of newspaper clippings. Um, and again, I think the, the attraction of the story for magazines, the, the type of tabloid magazine you mentioned and newspapers was it, it was such a visceral, personal battle that uh, you wouldn't expect to encounter on the ocean. Exactly. As you mentioned early on, it, th these were adversaries, um, you know, British and American ships and German U-boats 
they often fought without seeing each other or not seeing each other until the battle was over. Either a Navy ship was sunk or a German U-boat was sunk. But here was a case where the two ships collided literally in the middle of the ocean. It actually happened on Halloween, 1943. Oh. So we're facing the coming up with the 80th anniversary of the encounter. Mm. And so it's two ships, two crews locked in mortal combat. Um, and I think, and to the victor, you know, comes the publicity, but it figured greatly in stories, newspaper stories all across the country, magazines, and in the aftermath, um, these kind of tabloid magazines that you mentioned. And, you know, that's actually proved useful to me as well, because you'd read those magazine articles, and they clearly uh, kind of doctored the story or, you know, <laughs> turned it into a, a tabloid type of story. Yeah, yeah. But, but but they would include, you know, quotes from some of the crew members and you mm -hmm. pluck those quotes out. You know, you knew the true story, so you wouldn't, you know, you couldn't rely on the magazine for that. But you could get some of the emotion and some of the intensity yeah. that, that went into that battle. Yeah, and it was an intense battle. I mean, as you can see on the uh, on the cover, the illustration on the cover, the the bow of the uh, the destroyer actually rode up over the the sure. u-boat and they were locked were they locked together the for a time the, the intention was to uh, the tension the intention of the skipper of the boy a guy named charles hutchins um his intent was to ram the u-boat right. was not that unusual a tactic the british did it quite a bit but they did it in company with other ships so if something went amiss they would be able to rescue the the sailors from the damaged destroyer, but in this case, it's one U-boat and one destroyer, and in the attempt to ram, the U-boat shifted just a bit, shifted to mm -hmm. to port to 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 the left, which caused the buoy to ride up on top of the foredeck, and wow. yes, they were they were locked together. It was not a case of you know, separating and, and going off in their own directions, which they eventually did. But for a period of, you know, and how long does it take? 10 to 15 minutes, they were locked there. And either side could only choose to use what they had at hand, which turned out to be machine guns, submachine guns, pistols, in some cases, uh, throwing uh, shell casings. Um, <laughs> At, at each other so it was it was kind of a one-sided fight because the boy was on top had yeah. the advantage of you know the superior position but it was no less uh no less frantic and no less um savage yeah a battle yeah no it, it was an intense encounter and uh uh you, you write about it well it's it's very gripping um there's there's this wonderful uh, uh background information about the entire battle of the atlantic um, which can be a difficult conflict to understand because it was so wide ranging. Yeah, um, I mean the other there there are great accounts of the battle in its totality, but um, they sometimes can be uh, one sided. For example, if they're written by a British author, mm -hmm. they can also be encyclopedic. I mean, if you try to gather all the individual convoys and all yeah. the individual battles together. Um, it's more a case of, uh, of going through an encyclopedia than it is through a narrative history. So I tried to make it, I tried to give it that context. Right. I mean, the context is important, um, but I also wanted it to be uh, a human story, have a human element that you know, was there at the beginning and, and there at the end. So. Well, you succeeded admirably, and you know, congratulations on the book. I'd also like to point out that another book of yours um, has just been released in paperback. Sure, yeah. And that's that War with the Wind. I'll try to get that straight there. Right. Now, this is about the the U.S. Navy's uh, struggle with uh, Japanese kamikazes mm. in the stages of uh, World War II. Although, actually, when you when people consider Japanese kamikazes, they tend to think of it being coming at the very end of the war. Right. But it actually started a, a good deal earlier, you know, in 19, late 1943 and 1944, 44, but it was at the end where it became so savage. And really for the, it was not until the end that um, uh, 
naval authorities were willing to concede that was going on and stories started to come out to the American public. So mm -hmm. it was quite an event at the time, which also happens to uh, resonate uh, in conflicts today. I mean, suicide yeah. bombing is kind of a different phenomenon, but that was a clear element where it was used back in yeah. 1944. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, ha we have the Atlantic and, and we the have Pacific. the Pacific. So. <laughs> It's a two ocean war. Um, yeah, and, it is. And both from David Sears. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to, to me today. And good luck right. with the book. Well, thank you very much.